professor. And that might mean a lot of things to people. But one thing you can be sure that it means is that I'm overeducated. Uh, I was a receiver of formal education for over 25 years of my life. That's a lot of time. And during that time, I did a lot of assignments. Worked many, many hours on many, many assignments. And now that I'm out of school and back in school on the other side, I really feel a strong commitment. The world's invested a lot into me, and I have a strong desire to give back. Now, one thing that I felt nagging at me and growing as I did all of these assignments was that they weren't doing anybody else any good. They were doing some good for me. I was learning, I was learning things. So the assignments were valuable, but all that work, graded, thrown in the trash. I was doing the same assignments that everybody else in the class was doing. I was doing the same assignments that the people the year before had done. So when I became a professor myself, I made a commitment. I said, I am not going to waste students' work. And that's the message I want to deliver with this talk. Don't waste student work. Now, if you're watching this talk and you're any kind of teacher, trainer, instructor, professor, you might listen to the ideas that I'm going to give you today and think, that'll never work for me. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. They might not work for you. But what I don't want you to do is dismiss the main point. And the main point is that we have bright, hardworking students that can produce very valuable things. And you owe it to them, or you owe it to the world to try to get them to bring something more. So I'm going to describe five initiatives that I've successfully used in my five years of being a professor so far. And listen to them, and if you need to adapt them or if they inspire something better, perhaps you can use it in your own classroom. The first thing I'm going to talk about are writing summaries. Now, writing summaries, that's nothing new. People write summaries all the time. But again, they tend to write summaries. They all write the same summaries of the same papers year after year after year. So I'm in a field called cognitive science. Cognitive science is the understanding of minds from an information processing perspective. What I did was I started a website called the Cognitive Science Summaries website. Now, whenever I teach a class, I tell my students, listen, you've got to find a paper that's never been summarized before on the website, read the paper, write a summary, and turn it in, and I grade it. Now, students, this is a benefit for me, because students often have no idea what paper to write, and like every academic, I have a stack of papers I've been meaning to read. I say, here, these would be good. <laughs> they, they end up picking some of those papers, so then when I grade it, I'm interested too, because I'm grading summaries of papers that I was intending to read anyway. That's a side benefit. Uh, and then the students turn in the uh, summaries to me, and I grade them, and I edit them, I make them a little better, and I put them up on this website for everyone to see. Now, the quality of these summaries is surprisingly good. Uh, I uh, might have rejected one or two over the years that weren't good enough for the website, but in general, with a few edits, they're good enough for the website. Another issue is that technically it is the student's work, and they have the right to opt out of having their summary put on the web, but I will say that no student has done this. Some of them have it put up anonymously, and some had a note saying, please forgive me, I was an undergrad when I wrote this summary. <laughs> They know it's going to be on the web forever. But I want you to think about what this kind of thing does. They are doing something no one has done before. They have to do a paper that no one has summarized. Every student's doing a different summary. That's motivating. They're doing something new. They're doing something that's going on the web that other people will be able to read probably forever. So it's motivating. The other thing is that they get into depth, where most classes, mine included, are mostly about breadth of a topic. This is one part where they get into some really deep, nitty-gritty, in my case, about cognitive science. How is the experiment done? How is the programming done? They have to understand that to write the summary, so they get some depth, usually about something they're kind of interested in because they picked the paper. And then the final benefit is that everybody in the world benefits. I have people coming up to me at conferences saying, oh, you're Jim Davies, you're on the Cognitive Science Summaries website. Sometimes when you search for those papers, the first hit that you get is the summary that's on the website. So these benefits you'll see throughout the uh, examples that I'm going to give. Another one I try to have students do is writing mnemonics. Now, a mnemonic device is a, is a simple way to remember something. It's remembering something that's easy to remember, that's going to help you remember something that's hard to remember. So uh, 
A common one everyone's probably heard is I before E except after C, except as in A as in neighbor and way, unless it's weird. That is a common mnemonic phrase that people use for spelling. Okay, that's a mnemonic. Now, uh, all classes involve some amount of memorization, some more than others. Okay? The biological sciences need a lot of memorization, foreign languages need a lot, and some are more conceptual, but I think we can agree that most classes have some element of rote memorization. It's a pain. Most people don't think it's the most important part, but it'd be nice to get it out of the way. And mnemonics really help memory. If you look into the memory research and how to remember things that you really want to remember, mnemonics are one of the best deals in town. And one thing in cognitive science that's very hard to remember are what brain areas do. Now, brain areas, they all have names, but the areas are named based on where they are in the brain and kind of what they look like in a dead language. So you might have something like the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or the dendate nucleus. Now, the dendate nucleus, what that means literally is the thing that looks like a tooth that's kind of in the middle. But even if you know that, it doesn't tell you anything about what it actually does. Granted, the places in the brain were named long before we had any idea what they did, but still, we're stuck with the names, and now we need to remember what they're for. So, I tell my students, you have to make a mnemonic. Go find some brain area and what it does, and make up three mnemonics for three different brain areas and for class. Then I dedicate an entire class session to the students. They get up in front of the class, they present their mnemonics, we all laugh, they're often funny. The students give feedback, we make them better. The student goes back home and they post the mnemonic to my brain areas mnemonics wiki. And then they send me a URL and I grade it right off the web. Okay, again, the students are learning about the brain in class, hearing all these mnemonics. It's like a lecture on the brain, really. The student who made the mnemonic is probably gonna remember at least that for the rest of their life. <laughs> probably have a lot of classes in your history that you remember nothing from, so we get that. But not only that, anyone in the world now can use those mnemonics to help them remember things. That's my second initiative. The third one I've used successfully is flashcards. Now, flashcards, we're all used to paper flashcards, okay? They're good for drilling yourself and memorizing things. Nowadays, we have computerized flashcards. So there are several uh, w uh, websites and software programs out there that have computerized flashcards. Okay, that's no big deal. There are two things that are particularly good about computerized flashcards. The most important one is that the flashcards can keep track of what you got right and what you got wrong. So this is a flashcard from uh, a program that I use every morning called Anki, and what happens is, this is made for Japanese, here's the Japanese and what it means. It shows you this, the front of the card. You try to guess in your mind what that says, and then you look at the answer, and then you tell Anki, if you got it wrong, you just click again and it shows it to you in the same session, maybe a couple minutes later. And if you got it really easy, it doesn't ask you for a long time, in this case, 3.5 years. And so the algorithm that it uses is based on psychological studies of forgetting. It turns out the best time to review a fact is right before you're probably going to forget it. So Anki decides what, what um, cards you're supposed to review every day. I get on Anki every morning, I have no idea what cards it's gonna show me. So you don't waste a lot of time reviewing cards you already know, which is a big problem for flashcards. That's one major benefit of using this system. The other one is that once it's computerized, so once there's a deck made, a deck is what they call a bunch of flashcards on a particular topic. Once a deck is made, it can be shared with the world. All right, so what do I do? I tell my students, pick a lecture from this course, everyone gets a different lecture, and make a deck of flashcards based on that lecture. So I uh, start class and I'm saying, okay, who's doing the, the, the Anki deck for today? And somebody says, oh, me. So I make sure they understand everything. They take really careful notes. They go home and they make usually 15 to 60 flashcards that represent all the memorized material that is needed for that lecture. And students have given me great feedback about this. First of all, they use Anki and they use it for the class. And they're like, God, I'm really actually retaining this stuff. Most students aren't taught good study habits. And the other thing is that they really appreciate how they're forced to think differently about the subject matter. They say thinking about it in terms of questions and answers is really interesting and it forces me to think of it in a different way. And of course, it helps them think of it in ways that will probably get asked on a test, which is also good. But then the other benefit is this. After only one year, and I teach fairly small classes, after only one year, all of the lectures of all of my courses had decks of flashcards uploaded and ready for anybody. 
Now when I teach my class, the first day of class, I can say, here's the website. If you download these decks and you spend five minutes, 10 minutes a day reviewing these every morning, you will not have to worry at all about the memorization part of this course. Instead, you can focus on the skills, the deeper concepts, discussions. You don't have to stress out about the little bits of memory. I'm very happy about that one. The last thing I'm going to talk about is having students do actual research. Okay, research in the sciences means you're doing science. Research in anthropology, you know, it's also, well, that's also science. But uh, research just means pushing the ball forward of knowledge, right? We, uh, making progress and finding out new things about the world. So I'm talking mainly from a scientific uh, perspective, but I want everyone to understand that these ideas are not only for science. They're for all different kinds of disciplines that try to gain knowledge for the world. So what I do is I try to have students do actual scientific research. First, I'm going to start with an example of one that successfully worked for me, and then I'll talk something about the principles of how to make this happen. So my laboratory is the Science of Imagination Laboratory. And in this laboratory, we try to understand how people picture things in their head. So if I said, um, I made eggs this morning, and you come up with a vivid image in your mind, I didn't tell you what I was wearing or what my kitchen looks like or how I cooked the eggs or what the eggs look like. But you might imagine that stuff. We want to know where does it all come from. And one part of understanding how people imagine things is understanding the words that we use to describe things that we end up imagining. So if I said my uh, hand was above the table, what did I mean by above? If you don't really know what above means, it's hard to figure out what people are going to imagine. So I told all my students, pick a spatial word. Each group, each uh, programming group gets a, a different word. And study the cognitive science literature and see what people really mean by this stuff. So for example, my hand is above my foot. And now it's not so much about above my foot. No, this isn't a very good example. Now it's definitely not above my foot. So they make a computer program that would look at two objects and determine how true it was that one thing was above the other thing, for example. So we had students do above and below, in between, across from, uh, occlusion uh, in front of one another. And you know they would do this project and they would learn a little bit about this, again, getting into depth. Right? They had to do a spatial term that had never been done before. Okay? So they're doing something novel that's motivating. And after a couple of years of this, I had enough really good ones that I tied them all up, wrote a scientific paper, and submitted it to a conference on spatial reasoning, the Diagrams Conference, and it was accepted. Now, not only have the students done an AI project like thousands of students do across the world, but they did something new. They got their name on a publication. There were 13 names on that publication. I'm very proud that my undergraduate students just doing a class project are now graduating with their name on a publication, which is, is a wonderful thing, if they, particularly if they want to go on to, to be scientists. So how do you get this to work? Okay, this is not an easy thing. Okay? It needs some dedicated work to think about how this is going to be. There are a couple of pitfalls here. One is that the teacher needs to mastermind it, particularly if a lot of people are working on different aspects of the project, and if it's going to be going on for several years, the professor needs to have the whole picture in mind. The teacher needs to have the whole picture in mind of how it's all going to fit together. And then, once you have that, you break it up into assignment-sized chunks. Now, breaking it up into assignment-sized chunks is a little difficult because you are doing work that has never been done before. So I've had students come up to me and say, Dr. Davies, is this possible? And I say, I don't know. But it doesn't really bother me. I say, don't worry about your grade. If you find that it's impossible, in your write-up, show me why it is impossible. What did you learn, what did the world learn about this topic that we are now able to say this is impossible, something we didn't know before? Your grade will be fine. Okay? And then I can take that, and the next generation of students, I can make a better assignment. We haven't run into anything impossible yet. Okay. So, students do that. You, you mastermind the whole thing. You break it up into assignment-sized chunks. It doesn't matter if it's impossible. Now, you might... Uh, want to work into something, but you're not really sure enough about it. You don't know enough about it. You don't have time to read about it. You, uh, so you're not confident giving uh, an assignment. Maybe it's already been done before. That's no problem. You assign the students to find that out for you. You assign them to do a literature review. You're like, you know, I'm kind of interested in this. This group, you guys write a literature review. What's the state of the art of this research? What are the next steps to be taken? All of that. Write a paper on it. You take it, you grade it, next time you teach the course, you hand that paper back, you're like, 
What's the next step? Design an experiment, make a program, run a simulation, do a uh, ethnographic study, whatever it takes. Over the years, you might build up something that is eventually publishable. You get 16 names on the publication, who cares? The students care. <laughs> it's great. So in conclusion, I just want to reiterate. Motivation. They're doing something meaningful. All right? If you are in a discipline that is lucky enough to be doing applied work, okay, I'm doing basic research. If you're doing applied work, you can actually go out in the world and get a customer. You can go into the city and say, hey, do you need this done? Is there something about your organization that needs understanding? Is there a piece of software that you could use? Does the Ottawa Fringe Festival need something to help people schedule their, which plays they're going to see? The answer is yes, by the way. <laughs> and you can bring that back to your students and say, hey, look, they need this software. Build it. Very motivating when they know that there's somebody who actually needs it. They're not asking, like, what, what's this for? They know what the assignment's for. The customer comes into class and talks about it. Okay? If you do applied work, it's even better. Motivation's important. The next thing is it helps the world. The world benefits. You help future students. You help the uh, uh, scientific and, and uh, understanding in general of scholarly research in the world. And finally, they get into deep depth about the subject. There are over 20 million undergraduates and graduate students. This isn't even counting the bright high school students that could be doing work that's useful. 20 million students. Think of all the hours they spend every year struggling over assignments and what that could do. We have an obligation to not let all that hard work go to waste. So I urge you, don't waste student work. And if they end up being overeducated like me, well, at least they'll have done productive work along the way. Thank you.